Hello, thank you for joining us again. This is Austin Holmes from the Terry Eye Institute, and this is the second part of our series. In this talk, we'll be finishing up photography fundamentals. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the most important fundamental topic, and that's lighting. To give you an example of some of the challenges that we face in ophthalmic photography, I wanted to show this picture. It's very dramatic. You have a very bright beam surrounded by kind of a darker, diffuse background, and that shows you kind of the, the very stark contrast that we see um, when we're taking uh, ophthalmic photographs. There's three main categories of lighting, a slit beam only, a slit and a diffuse light used together, and diffuse only. Each one of these categories has a purpose and a, a, a point um, where it's useful. But before we talk about clinical photography, I just want to talk about some of the fundamentals of how we capture these photographs. What the eye sees and what the camera sees are very different. So what might work for a slit lamp examination might not necessarily work for photographing specific pathologies. So we have to learn the language first before we can apply it. In this first picture, we see a slit beam only. This is what we're typically used to seeing when we do a, a slit lamp examination. We have the bright beam, the slit beam, and we have the darker diffuse uh, background where you know you don't really see any details. This is good in some pathologies, but it's not the best for many pathologies. Now throughout this talk, I'm going to be using these diagrams that I adapted from a book called Slit Lamp Examination and Photography. And it really, I think, is the best I've seen that shows um, how we're able to get these photographs, where the tower position is and where the slit lamp position is, and in relation to the pathology. Now if we look at the same photograph, but now we add just a little bit of diffuse light, we see that it kind of improves the overall quality, not just of the background, but also of the specific pathology that we're looking at, which in this case is the vacuoles. Again, here's a diagram. You can either put the diffuse light on the opposite side of the slit beam, or you could put it on the same side if you so choose. But one of the benefits of having it on the opposite side is it gives a little bit more even illumination. Now for a lot of times when we're doing external photography, we just want a diffuse light. We don't want any slit beam on. Um, there's two choices. We have either a single diffuse light that's attached to the slit tower, or you can use a dual diffuse light um, that's attached to the slit tower. One of the problems with a single diffuse light is that there's a very bright area and there's a very dark area of the photograph. Sometimes that's useful in contrasting, but most of the times it's not. It's better to have an even illumination to improve the overall quality of the photograph. And here's the diagram of the single diffuse and dual diffuse illumination. Using those three basic types of lighting, we can come up with several lighting techniques to highlight specific pathologies. This is what I like to call the photographer's toolbox. There's two main categories that we're going to be discussing, direct illumination and indirect illumination. First, we're going to talk about direct illumination. The reason why we call it direct illumination is because the light, whether it's the slit beam or a diffuse light, is shown directly onto the pathology of interest. Two similar techniques are the coaxial and the tangential. Usually it uses a wide open slit beam or a diffuse light. And in the coaxial, the slit beam and the slit lamp are lined up, whereas in the tangential, the slit beam is at a, a very large angle in relation to the slit lamp. And this helps to contrast um, like either skin lesions or iris um, lesions, cysts, or just uh, a normal iris. The other direct illumination technique is the corneal cross-section. And 
A lot of people find this useful. It's also a very difficult technique to use. Um, this is useful in highlighting and photographing um, the corneal tissues and seeing any uh, changes within those tissues. Probably the most versatile of the techniques is indirect illumination. And this isn't this is where the light isn't shown directly onto the pathology of interest, but it's it's either reflected or it's um, transmitted through a medium to highlight the pathology um, by an indirect means. As an example, the first one is retroillumination from the fundus. So the light um, is shown through the pupil, it reflects off the retina, and it um, highlights anything in the lens. Um, and we do this through a dilated pupil. It's really good for showing any lens opacities or orientation markings on a toric lens. The other fundus retroillumination technique we do is through a constricted pupil, and this helps to highlight any changes in the iris, um, either thinning of the iris or um, if you're looking for PI openings. A useful technique for highlighting any corneal pathologies is retroillumination from the iris. And in this technique, the slip beam is uh, oriented about a 20 degree angle from the slit lamp and the light is uh, shown onto the iris right below the pathology that you want to highlight. Typically this is also best when you have a little bit of background illumination to improve the overall quality of the photograph. A similar technique um, is specular reflection and this is very useful in highlighting any endothelial changes in the cornea. And as you can see, the slit lamp or the slit beam and the slit lamp are about 50 degrees um, from each other. And um, you could also use this in highlighting uh, other corneal changes um, in different layers, but its 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 main usefulness is looking at the endothelial cells. One of the most complex techniques we'll discuss is called sclerotic scatter, and this actually has a two-part um, way of doing it. First, you you swing the tower over probably about 50 degrees, and then you rotate the entire tower so that way the light is directly shining onto the limbus of the eye at almost a perpendicular angle, as you can see in this diagram. And what this does is it allows the light to illuminate the entire cornea um, using a physics principle known as total internal reflection. The last technique in our toolbox is called proximal illumination. And this is where the light is shown, not on the pathology, but right next to the pathology. And it just allows kind of a diffuse light to spread over and highlight the pathology. You can either use this for corneal opacities or uh, corneal pathologies um, and in, in certain types of lens opacities. So let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about clinical photography. So we discussed some of the lighting techniques and now in this section we're going to start learning how to apply those techniques to photographing certain specific types of pathologies. We're going to cover the adnexa and the conjunctiva, tear disorders, um, which actually I'm going to make a whole other video on because that's a very uh, complicated one. The cornea, anterior chamber, and the posterior chamber. So the first one is the lids and lashes, the palpebral conjunctiva, and the bulbar conjunctiva. So sometimes we see certain lid lesions, and in this case we want to use a dual diffuse light because that helps to show the three-dimensionality of the lesion that we're looking at, and it also improves the overall quality of the photograph, so you get a very clear image, a very evenly illuminated image, so that way it's highlighted the best that it could possibly be highlighted. However, in some cases, we want just a single um, diffuse illumination that's tangentially um, oriented to the pathology. In this case, um, you can see this very lar large lid lesion in the upper lid. And when you um, use this type of tangential illumination, it helps to highlight some of the um, 
central puckering that you see there in that lesion. Um, if you use any other type of lighting technique, you probably wouldn't see that quite as well. Another time that you want to use tangential illumination is when you're looking at saponification. It kind of reminds me of when you're looking at a clear cell through a microscope. How do you contrast that? And the best way to contrast that is with using this kind of pseudo indirect illumination with the, the tangential illumination. And you can really see that highlighted here on this photograph in this patient who had uh, meibomian gland dystrophy or MGD. Thinking of the meibomian glands, it's possible to image some of the meibomian glands with a coaxial direct illumination, as you can see in this photograph. If you look closely, you'll notice the white lines in the palpebral conjunctiva that run uh, perpendicular to the lid margin, and those are the meibomian glands. This is useful when we're looking at meibomium dropout um, in MGD and tracking its progression over time. Now this is one of my favorite pictures. Not that it's extremely interesting, but the story that's behind it, it really helps to highlight the importance of photographs in patient education and how it helps um, with compliance issues. This particular patient didn't really have too many symptoms, but as you can see by the photograph, they have pretty significant blepharitis, um, even border, bordering on ulcerative blepharitis. But one thing that really stands out in particular is that there's a finding of cylindrical dandruff. And this is very important um, that it's sometimes associated with demodex. So in this patient, we pulled the lashes and we put those lashes under the microscope. And sure enough, we saw some mites, um, some demodex mites. And we actually got a video of it. So let me play that for you. Here's the demodex mite at 100 power, and I'm going to flip it up to 400 power, and you can really see the mouth parts moving and the legs moving around as well, too. When the patient saw that, in addition to their eye findings, they definitely took our recommended treatment to heart. And um, what we recommended for them was 50% tea tree oil. It is possible to use 100% tea tree oil scrubs, but that can be a little bit irritating to the eyes, so we don't use it. And a lot of journal articles also use 50% um, tea tree oil lid scrubs. A happy ending to the story is that um, over time, this patient's symptoms improved. We also looked at the patient's other eye, and uh, we could see that there was um, some blepharitis present as well, too, some cylindrical dandruff. But when we pulled down the lid, we also noticed that there was quite a few inclusion cysts and just kind of a, a general irritation of the eye as well, too. And, and that's not completely uncommon in Demodex as well. Depending on the pathology we're looking at in the bulbar conjunctiva, there's different techniques we can use. In this particular example, we have an area of scleral thinning. In the first picture on the left-hand side, I used a dual diffuse light um, that gives us a good overall picture, shows us the area of the thinning and how large it is, but it doesn't really give us a good idea of the depth of the thinning. And so when you add in a little bit of the slit beam, a very narrow um, bright slit beam, you can see the depth of that. On the right hand picture, if you look very closely, you can see it bowing in. It looks concave. And this gives us a better estimate of that thinning. And we can track that change over time to see if it's progressing or not. In this particular case, um, <laughs> this was interesting, is that um, this patient was bitten by an ant, and you can see the swelling that's associated with it. Um, and if we use a tangential uh, illumination, we can really um, show how swollen uh, and the height of that swelling. Now let's talk about some tear film disorders or dry eye evaluation. As I said before, I'm going to do a whole other video on this. Um, that goes into a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to kind of go over some of some of the uh, the basics of it. Um, so I came up with a little video uh, videography protocol um, where we look at uh, fluorescein, uh, the microsphericals, which I'll explain in a little bit, tear meniscus, and 
lid closure. The first thing is having the proper illumination for a fluorescein examination. Um, the, the picture on the left is an image of just using a full open slit beam, the cobalt blue light, whereas on the right hand picture, in addition to the, uh, the slit beam, the full open slit beam cobalt blue, we also attached a cobalt blue LED light to the tower. And as you can see, you can get a much wider field. You can see uh, more of the tear film on both the cornea and the conjunctiva, and you get a better image of the tear meniscus. So if possible, it would definitely be better to have a, um, a full-field blue light. Another secret to good fluorescein examination is using a yellow barrier filter. Um, these are available from camera stores. It's a Rattan 12 filter and let me show you why these are useful especially not only for examination but especially for photography if we look at the picture on the left hand side first um, this is just using a full filled cobalt blue light and you can see that there's two large areas of superficial punctate keratitis uh, SPKs and they're surrounded by um, more diffuse more subtle SPKs However, when we use our yellow barrier filter, um, we can see that it really helps to highlight those two um, large areas of SPKs. We could see that there's a, a large third one that's to the right of those, and we can see the full extent of the subtle, more, uh, more subtle diffuse SPKs that are surrounding it. So when we use that filter, you can see that we get a much more clear picture of the full extent of what's going on. Now. This is a very obvious picture here. Where this really comes in handy clinically is when you have very, very subtle SPKs that are hard to see with just a blue light. That yellow filter can really help to highlight those and um, really can help you see what's going on. The next part of the dry eye evaluation or, or looking at tear film disorders is um, the tear, looking at the tear meniscus. And the best way to do that, as you can see from the diagram on the lower right hand side, is have the slit lamp facing directly towards the eye straight on and having the slit beam um, at a 45 degree angle. Um, and it's going to be a very intense, um, narrow slit beam. And the reason why this works is because it allows um, a birefringence of the tear meniscus, as you can see in the lower uh, part of the picture. Um, if you look really closely under the red line, you can see that line of the tear meniscus. I just highlighted it in red so it helps to um, highlight that. Now, this is good for a subjective measurement. However, it's always important to, to try our best to objectify measurements so we can look at change over time. And using um, some programs um, either on a smart device or if you're more comfortable on a Mac or a PC, you can measure um, the, the, the length or the height of the tear meniscus. Now, it's a completely arbitrary measurement. It's not in millimeters or centimeters or inches or anything like that. Um, it's just units. So in this case, the patient came in, we measured the tear meniscus as 8.3 units. Um, and then over time, we can, you know, on the next exam, we can remeasure it and see if there's been any changes. So case in point, we could start them on artificial tears mixed with castor oil and a secretagogue. And then over that month time period, they would come back, we would measure it. And if it was at 10 units, then we know that there was a significant change in their tear meniscus, most likely as a result of the treatment. The next part of the dry eye evaluation is looking at two different um, aspects. Microsphericals, which is an indication of meibomian gland function, um, and this is done by using what we call the spot test, and also lid closure evaluation. And the best app for that is called SlowPro, and this allows for slow motion videography at about 60 frames per second. Um, so it really, really helps to slow that down. Now the best way to show these is with a video, because after all, as I said before, video is worth um, a million words. So here's a dynamic tear film analysis. All the videos were taken with an iPad 3. 
First step is looking at the aqueous component, both the upper and the lower tear meniscus. There's a yellow barrier filter. This is what a normal tear meniscus looks like. It's robust as compared to a decreased tear meniscus. This is where we would add them on artificial tears with castor and a secretagogue. Now here's the meibomian microspheracles. If you look at the spot on the slit beam, you can see them moving around. And that's the meibomian uh, from the meibomian glands. This is what um, meibomian looks like on the uh, lid margin. And it's highlighted with fluorescein. One of the nice things about the dynamic tear film analysis is it helps us to appreciate new findings. Now here's the blink analysis, and if we slow it down with the slow pro app, we can see that. And that's the normal blink with the slow pro app. Here it is. As you can see, we have full closure. Whereas when we look at an abnormal blink, it has more of like a fluttering type of appearance. And here's the same patient, um, and you can see that there's a lot of SPKs right where the, the lid stops. There it is, right there. And here it is slowed down again with the Slow Pro app. In that case, forced lid closures throughout the day would probably be the best treatment. Now here's a mucus tear film. You can really see it just sort of looks very thick and syrupy is how we like to call it. Here's another mucus tear film. And here's someone that has probably a decreased oil component. Some basement membrane dystrophy in addition to a very poor. Now this was an unusual case. Um, you can see some really unusual markings. And when we um, did the analysis, we realized that the person had a punctal plug and if we, if, if we have the patient move the eye over, we notice that it matches up directly right where um, the punctal plug would scrape against the eye. We can also examine the margins. Here's a pretty normal mar looking margin. Whereas, here's some plugged up meibomian glands. And some blepharoconjunct blepharoconjunctivitis, um, you can see some mucousy discharge and the margins are all red, the, the eye is all red. So there's a lot of benefits to the dynamic tear film analysis. And as I said, I'll go into more detail about all that um, at a later video. Now for one of the most interesting uh, types of photography, corneal photography. This is probably one of the most difficult type of photography because there's so many different subtle findings. Now here's an image of ocular surface di disorder. One of the nice advantages of photography is it's not only useful in tracking disease, but you can also use it when you do clinical trials. Um, there's been studies that looked at uh, the use of smart device photography um, compared to an, an observer, at um, a live observer, um, to see if there was any difference. And there was no significant difference found in grading of uh, especially um, SBK or, or ocular surface disorder problems. This particular patient, as you could see, had SPK centrally um, right over the cornea, so their vision was significantly affected. They were started on 20% autogalous serum drops, um, and we have a picture on the left-hand side of the pre-serum treatment, and um, we did a follow-up two months later, and you can see that it was mostly resolved, not fully resolved, but mostly resolved, and that the treatment was definitely working, and there would be a significant di significant difference in the grading of these two pictures. So again, it's very useful for clinical trials in addition to patient education and follow-up. One of the more difficult pictures to get is peripheral thinning. And the best way to do this is with proximal illumination. As you can see, I'm shining the slit beam a little bit off um, next to the, the area of interest, and it really helps to highlight that peripheral thinning. And um, you can see a diagram picture of it. You'd have the slit lamp straight on and the light just a little bit off. And you could even maybe rotate the whole tower just a little bit so um, you get a better angle. It, it really depends on the patient um, to see what works best.
Now here's an interesting case of an endothelial corneal scar, and this is really good because it highlights several different techniques that we can use to image the same type of pathology and what those look like. The first one is with a, a, a full open slit beam with, at a tangential angle, and it helps to show that opacity. Um, you could also use retroillumination from the iris, as, as you can see on the right-hand picture, and this helps to highlight the branching um, the extent of the branching of the neovascularization into that scar. Now the big question is, is how do we know it's an endothelial corneal scar? Because from neither one of these pictures can we tell. And this is where the corneal cross-section comes in handy. Now just to remind you, if you look at the lower right-hand diagram, in order to get the proper imaging, the slit lamp and the tower have to be at a 50 degree or greater angle, and the slit light has to be at a very high intensity narrow beam. And if we look closely at the picture, uh, we can tell that it's the endothelium that's being highlighted. And, and again, this is the only way to tell which layer is being affected. Now, retroillumination isn't useful just for looking at the lens. You can also look at changes in the cornea. And when we're looking at RK cuts, because those are so subtle, the best way to to tell those is by using the retroillumination um, technique with a dilated pupil as you can see in this picture. Now here's an example of using sclerotic scatter and in this picture you can see that the patient had granular dystrophy. Now this technique is challenging in the sense that you have to get the exact right angle and just to remind you if you look at the lower right hand side diagram you would swing the tower over and then you would rotate the entire tower so it's facing perpendicular to the limbus. And you have to kind of play with the angle of the tower to be able to get the right picture. And uh, that takes a little bit of practice, but it's definitely worth it as you can see by looking at these two pictures. First, if we look at the left hand picture, um, we can kind of see the dystrophy but it's very subtle. And this picture was taken using a um, tangential uh, illumination. Whereas if we look at the picture on the right hand side where we use the sclerotic scatter technique, you can see that it's, it's easy to see the dystrophy. You can see the full extent of it. Now another tip when taking this type of photograph is to take it with a dilated pupil because as you can see that dark background really helps to uh, contrast the white dystrophy and makes it much more visible. Another difficult uh, condition to, to take an image of is the epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, or MAP dot dystrophy. And um, these are very, very subtle, but the best way to, to take this type of an image is using a retroillumination from the iris. And this kind of, um, especially over a dilated or a dilated pupil or a darker iris, again, these are white in color, so having that darker background will help to um, highlight those, those dystrophies. Now the one technique we haven't covered so far when taking corneal pictures is specular reflection. And this is um, extremely useful when we're looking at endothelial changes. It's similar to uh, the corneal cross section except the angle between the slit lamp and the tower isn't quite as great. It's maybe about a 30 degree angle. So it's not good at looking the f at the full extent of the corneal tissue layers, but it does help to highlight the endothelial layer very well. And you can see that even very subtle changes such as this endothelial fold is easily visible with this technique. One thing we've been playing with is um, looking or taking images through uh, an endothelial cell counter, as you can see by this image here. Um, this is still kind of a work in progress, but it's definitely a future direction that will be taking um, our photography. And this, this has a, a lot of valuable uses to it, especially monitoring fugues dystrophy or similar conditions. Now let's talk about the anterior chamber. It is possible to look at cells or flare in the anterior chamber. It's, it's kind of difficult to image because of the subtlety of these um, cells, 
but if you look very closely at this image where the, the red arrows are, you can see those white dots. And the only way you could possibly get these type of pictures is by using what we call a high intensity pencil of light. Now what that means is that everything is turned up uh, to the maximum setting and you have the narrowest possible beam and you shine it at about a 45 to a 50 degree angle with the slit lamp facing direct onto the eye. And um, again, these are very difficult to take, but with some practice and with enough cells in the anterior chamber, it is possible to get them. Now these two images help to really highlight um, why tangential illumination is important when taking iris photographs. If we look at the picture on the left, um, this is a coaxial diffuse light plus a slit beam, and you can you can see the iris is there, um, but you lose a lot of the details, the th especially the three-dimensional details that are present within the iris, whereas if you do a tangential illumination, it really helps to highlight the crypts or any changes within the iris. Now here's a case of a traumatic injury to the iris, and we use different techniques to highlight various parts of that injury. The first one, uh, the picture on the left, we used a, uh, in this case, a coaxial uh, single diffuse light to show the overall picture um, and the, the overall extent of the injury to the iris. On the second picture to the right hand side, where we use just a high intensity slit beam, you could see that there's a little bowing in of the beam, so there's uh, so the, the iris is kind of bowed in a little bit, and then we can also see a little bit deeper um, through the pupil and behind the iris, there's some changes there as well. Now to highlight um, the exact extent and areas of uh, iris thinning, we used a retroillumination through a constricted pupil, and some of these areas, especially if you look on the top of the picture above that large area of thinning there you could see some smaller subtle ones those weren't quite as obvious on other pictures so this this definitely gives us a more clear idea what's going on um, and how much thinning is occurring now here's one of the more difficult uh, anterior chamber photos to to get and that's pseudo exfoliation now one of the only ways to get that is with a high intensity diffuse tangential illumination. Now continuing down through the interior chamber, let's talk about lens photographs for a little bit. One of the most common type of cataracts is cortical spoking, and it's also one of the most interesting to photograph as well. And the two best ways to photograph it is using a slip beam with just a little bit of diffuse um, illumination and retroillumination. The nice thing about a slit beam is that it gives you an optical cross section of the lens and um, it could also, you can see a little bit of the cortical spoking as well. But with that retroillumination, you can really see the full extent of the cortical spoking and you can also see how it is progressing into the center of the lens and therefore probably uh, significantly affecting the patient and most likely causing glare issues as well. Now as we look at this next picture, we can see that um, here's a rather significant uh, lens opacity. And with something this large, the best way to image it is using a proximal illumination. Again, this is where we shine uh, the light next to the area of interest, and that allows the light to kind of diffuse over and um, get the full extent of that pathology, as you can see in this picture. Now a topic of large discussion, um, and could be for a, long, for a long talk, is torque lenses. There's a lot of applications uh, with photography. Um, the first step is, of course, getting the picture. And the best way to do that is, again, with the retroillumination technique, because it really helps to highlight those orientation marks. Now, using um, Photoshop, we can overlay a compass rose um, over the center of the lens, and that way we can see the angle of the orientation markings, and we can compare it to uh, our pre-op calculations to, to make sure that there's been no shifting of the lens. Um, there's other applications, as I said, we can do back calculations, um, and there's a lot of research going in on that uh, idea, but, but that's going to be saved for another talk. 
The last section for this talk is going to be the posterior chamber, just a couple quick photographs. When we look at the vitreous, we want to have the tower at about a 10 or 15 degree angle. That way we don't get the retro illumination effect, but anything greater than that, and you won't be able to get enough light into the, uh, into the vitreous or the posterior chamber to image it. As an example, here's an image of asteroid hyalosis showing off that technique. It is possible to image the fundus using a handheld lens, and we found that a 78 diopter lens is the easiest to use. Now, I do have to admit, it does take quite a bit of practice to be able to get these images, um, and the difficulty lies in finding the right angle of the lens and the tower to minimize the glare that the camera sees. That concludes this series. Next time, we'll talk about other applications in ophthalmology using smart devices, archiving, billing, and advanced communication. We'll see you next time.